we mostly covered viruses. We stopped here, right, on vaccines. Um, I'd like to have more time to talk about vaccines because it's an interesting topic. Um, but maybe we'll spend some more time doing that when we talk about the immune system later in the semester. But I'd really like to make sure we get a good, uh, good jump on biodiversity. So what do you guys remember about viruses? Living or non-living? Not probably non-living, right? But they're kind of on that weird cusp in between alive and not alive. So what do they do that is a, a, a characteristic of life? Yeah, they mutate. They have DNA, right, or RNA. They have nucleic acid, so they have those building blocks. Um, what about reproduction? Can they reproduce? Yes. They can, so but there's a caveat for that. What's that caveat? Yeah, they're parasitic, right? Basically, obligate intracellular parasites. Um, you guys remember the term for a particle, viral particle? Virion, yeah. Um, and what's a capsid? Hmm? Yeah, it's enclosed in that protein coat, right? And that protein coat's the capsid. Um, let's see, what's a, what about an envelope? You guys remember what an envelope virus is? So bad. The envelope is that extra outer layer that helps them hide, right? Not all viruses are envelopes, but a lot of them are. Makes them better at um, sneaking in. I think they gotta get in before they can replicate. So we talked about some of that stuff. We talked about hosts. Everything on the earth, essentially, that's alive has a virus that is specific to it. Um, Protists, bacteria, we're talking about phages, plants, humans, other animals. Um, viral replication, uh, we talked about those hypotheses of viral origins, remember that? That was something I told you to just know the details on that slide and nothing uh, further. Just talking about invasion, talked about budding, we talked about oh, new viruses mutating and arising, and we talked about vaccines. Okay. So I think that gets us up to speed. Um, treatment, so can you cure a virus? Are there any viruses for which there is currently a cure? Trivia. Anybody think you know? No. That is correct. There are not. Unless, unless there's something that I'm unaware of, which is always possible. But um, no. So you can treat them. You can vaccinate against them. Um, but the best treatment is prevention, which is why we talk about vaccines. But interestingly, you can also use vaccines as a treatment for certain viruses. So the way that that works is that you've already been exposed and you know that you've been exposed to this particular virus, and then you get the vaccine. So um, this happens with rabies. Have you guys ever heard about rabies vaccine? It's a pretty gnarly series of shots. I think they give them to your stomach, like they used to. I don't know how they do it now, but um, you can get the shots after you've been bitten by a rabid animal. Um, and what happens is because the virus itself progresses pretty slowly, you have this window of time during which that vaccination activates your immune system and sort of charges it up and allows it to fight off the virus before it reaches its worst symptoms. So before it gets into your neurological tissue and causes uh, irreversible damage or death, your immune system is strong enough to fight it off. So it's kind of a race against time. Yeah, David. Yeah, so like, uh, uh, okay, near the place where you were actually bitten by the rabbit animal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that much about rabies vaccines these days, but that's an interesting topic. Um, yeah, and Ebola, they, there's been some work done that works well with that as well, treating Ebola with a vaccine. So before you die, uh, you can get a, get a vaccine and hopefully don't die, right? That's the idea. So sometimes that works in certain cases. Um, and we also, in other cases, have antiviral drugs. So antiviral drugs, that's a tricky one. Um, because you're basically trying to, with any medication, so think about something like an antibiotic, which we've talked about a little bit, and we'll talk about more um, in the next chapter, but what you're doing is interrupting metabolic processes, okay, that are going on in the pathogen itself. So in the case of viruses, they're not very complex, right? They're just nucleic acid and protein coats, and many times they are using the host's machinery, Right, host DNA, host RNA, host enzymes, host proteins to do functions, right? To carry out their metabolic pathways. So the idea with, with drugs to interrupt uh, replication or to interrupt 
other uh, maybe building of the capsid itself or in, ter in terms of bacteria, things like their cell wall. And you're interrupting those processes to keep them from being able to complete their life cycle. So that's the idea with treatment um, with drugs. So the tricky thing with antiviral drugs is that so many of those metabolic pathways are actually host pathways. You guys with me? So it's by targeting these particular, uh, let's say you're targeting an enzyme. Well, if it's a host enzyme that the virus is just using, then you are not only uh, preventing the virus from being able to use that enzyme, but also the host cell. Does that make sense? So it's hard to target metabolic pathways that viruses that are virus specific. And so you're sort of limited to this very small set of, uh, of chemical and metabolic processes that viruses are doing for themselves. Those are the only ones you can really target for interruption without also interrupting the integrity of the host cell. Does that make sense? Nobody's nodding. That's not a good sign. Yeah? So you're, you're actually, by treating, by giving somebody a medication that interrupts the processes that the virus is doing, you can also be interrupting the processes that the host cell is doing too, which is detrimental to the health of that host cell. And so antiviral drugs are difficult to develop because of that limited number of sort of processes that are virally encoded that you can target in the first place. And they mutate really quickly. So it's very easy for a virus to mutate in such a way that it can bypass whatever metabolic process you have interrupted with that antiviral drug. Okay, because all they have to do is make a little change that changes one little chemical process and then they can sort of go have a workaround, okay, so to speak. Um, but there are some examples that work pretty well. Uh, Tamiflu, have you guys ever heard of Tamiflu? You get the flu, you test positive, and you get to the pharmacy fast enough, they'll give you Tamiflu. It doesn't cure you, remember, there's no cure for any virus, but it can shorten the duration of your uh, flu or lessen your severity of symptoms. Same thing with Valtrex for um, herpes simplex and um, AZT, which we'll talk about just a little bit, which is a, an HIV medication, breakthrough HIV medication um, from 20 years ago or so. All right, um, so this slide is basically talking about HIV and antiviral cocktails, so it's building on that same idea. Um, so AZT came out and it worked really, really well, but it only works for a short period of time. Because the HIV virus mutates so quickly, um, it can, again, work around that pathway that AZT interrupts. So the thing that we do now, the treatments, the best treatment for people who have HIV infections now, is this high, highly active antiretroviral therapy, or HART, as we hear, right, the acronym. It's basically a cocktail. Have you guys heard of this before, a, a drug cocktail? It means you're taking multiple things, right, multiple different compounds, and they're all targeting different processes that the virus is undergoing. Okay, so the idea is that maybe the virus in your system mutates so it can bypass one of those processes and do something a little differently, evade the medication, but it's hard to mutate in just the right way to evade four or five different types of medication at the same time. So it's a combination therapy and it's playing a number thing because remember mutations are random, but viruses mutate quickly because they rep replicate quickly and because there's a lot of room for error in that viral replication. So um, a cocktail is basically just throwing four or five different things at the same virus so that it can't mutate simultaneously in five perfect ways. Does that make sense? So you're just sort of throwing a whole lot of things into the mix. Um, it works pretty well. And that's what this video is about. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna leave this to you guys to watch. You'll see questions on this. It's kind of like the Rock Pocket My Stream where you will see questions about this video. It's 10 minutes, so watch it on your own. You got the link right there. I'll remember to remind you guys when it gets closer to test time that you have to have watched that. And then the last thing is a little bit of information on the coronavirus. Um, this is something also that you can look at on your own. There's an interactive graphic, but it was put out in the summer. So how much do we know now versus what we knew in June of 2020 about coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2? What do you think? A lot more. So this is still good information, but it's probably not cutting edge. There's nothing in this about new variants. There's nothing in this about vaccines that have been approved for emergency use or anything like that. So take a look at it, but it's nothing like earth shattering. Um, the things that I do want to sort of pop in here um, is the term zoonosis. So that term will come up again in our prokaryote chapter that we're just about to start. You guys know what a zoonosis is? 
you've never heard that term before, zoonotic disease. What does that mean? Grace, you're nodding. It comes from animals. Yeah, it comes from an animal host. Right? So it jumps from an animal into a person. Um, zoo is your clue, right? When you want to see animals, where do you go? The zoo. So zoology, right? That's where that root word comes from. So zoonosis is a disease that comes from another animal and then makes that host jump into humans. Um, so there's some information about that. And there's a video that's actually like, yeah, it looks like a blank screen. It's just a white stuff screen for a video, but you guys can watch that too. It's also um, a couple of months old. So if you're following the developing situation very closely, none of this is going to be like earth shattering information. But if you're not following it very closely and reading everything, you might learn something. So take a peek at that. Okay. So probably bonus questions from the SARS video, um, but for sure questions from the HIV video, okay, on the next video, which is way down, about a month away. And that's the end of that. Okay. So a nice little um, jump into the world of biodiversity with our first group, which may be not even be alone. All right, let's talk about prokaryotes. Here is a uh, an opportunity for you to remind yourselves and tell me what you remember about prokaryotes from bio one. What is a prokaryote? Anybody? Well, who is in the group? Two domains, two out of three domains of life, bacteria and archaea, right? So if you are not a prokaryote, what are you? A eukaryote, right? So what does a eukaryote have that a prokaryote does not? What makes you a eukaryote? Maybe multicellular. Are there single-celled eukaryotes? We'll talk about that in chapter 23. Those are your protists, or some of your protists. So, but that's definitely on the right track because we're getting towards complexity. Right, and which ultimately leads to multicellularity. So, what is it about eukaryotes that's more complex than prokaryotes? How about the uh, where the genetic information is stored? Nucleoid. You're get, yeah, you guys are dancing around it. Perfect. Nucleoid is what the prokaryote has. Nucleus is going to be eukaryote, right? What's a nucleus? It's an organelle, right? Cellular organelle, the central organelle is often described as. The DNA is inside of it, right? And it's wrapped in what? Yeah, a nuclear envelope. So it's basically like a little miniature uh, cell membrane, only it's the nuclear membrane, right? It's around the nucleus. So your DNA is housed inside of it. That's one of the things that makes a, a eukaryote more complex. So we're talking about prokaryote. We're talking about organisms that don't have that true nucleus. And that's where the name comes from. So when you see the root word or the uh, prefix pro, it kind of means the same thing as pre. It's like before. Okay, so that's something that came before. And karyote means uh, kernel or seed in, I think, Greek, but it means nucleus. Okay, so when you see karyo, you're looking, you're thinking nucleus. If the prokaryote just means an organism that evolved before the nucleus. Okay, so none of them have a nucleus. That's what they're named for. Um, again, out of the three domains of life, so here's our phylogenetic tree of life. You guys will see this tree uh, in your book a lot. It's like a favorite of the authors. Um, you will see, I have to point this out because this is important since we just talked about polytomy. What's going on right here? Here we are in animals, right? Sister to fungi and protists are branching off here. They're all at that same node. That bothers me. Why does that bother me? Because it's polytomy, right? Do we know more about the relatedness of these three kingdoms? Oh, sorry, I thought that said protists and said plants. See, just as bad, right? Do we know more about animals, fungi, and plants than what that tree indicates that we know? Absolutely, right? So the reason, this is also a really good example talking about phylogenetic trees. They can vary depending upon the question that that tree is addressing. Okay, so in this tree, this is actually a pretty famous tree that comes from a paper that um, explains that bacteria and archaea are two separate domains. We'll talk a little bit about that here uh, coming forward. But what this, the reason that this is polytomic right here is because the data, the piece of molecular data that they're analyzing is unique to prokaryotes. So they're using ribosomal RNA. And we're gonna, that's not that important. But what the reason that this happens is that all eukaryotes have the same kind of ribosomal RNA. So when you make a tree based on that sequence of that particular uh, genetic molecule, these guys fall out as all on the same branch. Because we have the same ribosomal RNA. 
So you don't really need to know that, okay? I'm not gonna quiz you on this tree and ask you about that polytomy at that branch, but I wanna point it out because A, I told you that this will never happen if we don't, if we know the relationship that you shouldn't see that, but I also mentioned that there might be times when you would see it because of the type of data that was being used and that's what I'm talking about, okay? Don't let, don't let it be too confusing, but if you were wondering, that's what's going on here. So this tree is based on um, looking at 16S ribosomal RNA, not a huge point of contention for you guys, but this is the tree that was first proposed that shows that bacteria and archaea are two different things. This happened in like the 70s, okay? So not that long ago. Uh, before that, we put all single-celled organisms in the same big group called Monera. You guys ever seen old trees with Monera on it? I don't know if you've seen them in high school biology textbooks or, or whatnot. Um, but the three domain system of classification is fairly young, okay, in biology. Um, and sometimes you will still see it taught in other ways, all right? So it's interesting how, that, how long that can take to, um, to change over. And we're going to talk in this chapter, because we're talking about both bacteria and archaea, we're going to talk about the differences between these two groups, even though they're more similar, especially at first appearance, than they appear to be different, okay? So that's why they were classified together for a very long time. They are both, both groups, which include lots and lots of different species and other taxa, um, are unicellular. So what does it mean to be unicellular? One cell, that's the whole organism. Okay, so we're talking about not only organisms that evolved before the nucleus, but well before the evolution of multicellularity. Okay, so just single-celled organisms, no membrane-bound nucleus in bacteria or archaea, no prokaryotes have that, also, no membrane-bound organelles besides the nucleus. So when we talk about membrane-bound organelles, what are we talking about? Do you guys remember? From again, pull back way back to cell biology. Any examples that come to mind? Mitochondria, double membrane-bound organelle, right? So you won't see those in prokaryotes. What about Golgi body? Membranous, right? So you won't see those. What about uh, endoplasmic reticulum? Membranous, right? So you won't see those. Lysosomes, peroxisomes, none of that, right? Anything that's membrane bound that you see in a eukaryotic cell, which is most of the organelles that you learn, right? When you learn cell biology, you don't find those in bacteria or archaea. Okay, so they're fairly simple as far as structure goes, okay? And then look, okay, if you were, if you were a scientist and you were looking through a microscope and you see something that's single cell with no membrane bound organelles or nucleus, how are you going to tell that it's bacteria versus archaea? Right? They look the same. They're single cells and microscopic. So it's no wonder that they were lumped together for such a long time. So we're going to talk about some of the things that make them different, um, mostly just as, a, as an exercise in talking about the complexity okay? and, and talking about evolution. So we'll get to that. Here's some of the differences. The differences are in the chemical makeup of the cell membrane. What is their cell membrane made of? what type of chemical components are in there, they are different in bacteria versus archaea. And I'm not gonna make you know how they're different or what molecules are different, just know that there are differences, okay? So it kind of makes sense that it would take us until sort of modern biology to figure that part out. And also differences in their ribosomal RNA. Remember that's what this tree is based on. So you have to be able to look at ribosomal RNA, which is also a relatively recent development in biotechnology, being able to do that. Okay, um, so when you look at these differences, even though taking all of these similarities into, into consideration, when you look at these differences, bacteria and archaea are as different from one another as they are from eukaryotes, which, make, which makes them in two different domains, okay? In fact, here's a little uh, trivia or sort of test for you on reading trees. Which, two, which of the two domains, bacteria or archaea, does it look like is more closely related to you, bacteria or archaea? Hmm? Archaea, why do you say that? It's closer. It's closer, meaning that it shares a more recent node, right? Recent, more recent common ancestor. So right here, you guys see that? That's the common ancestor, eukarya and archaea. And then down here, common ancestor for everybody, okay? The bacteria split off, Archaea split off, eukarya split off from there. Okay, so we're actually close, more closely related to archaea, we think. 
but this is all kind of cool stuff and we may talk about this in uh, the next in the next chapter we're going to read some stuff about the evolution of, of eukaryotes and we'll look at some of these questions it's kind of interesting because we still don't really know for sure there's data that supports different hypotheses so i always like to talk about things that are ongoing that we don't know the, the full answer to yet that's why science is fun right it's always something new to learn if you don't know everything all right where are prokaryotes? Spoiler alert, right? Everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're on every surface. They're inside your body. They're on your skin. They're everywhere. Anywhere on the planet that is habitable, there are your prokaryotes. And the weird thing about prokaryotes is when we talk about habitable, that is a, a relative term. What does it mean to be habitable? If, it, if an area is habitable, you can do what there? Live, yes. Conditions are favorable to support life as we are comfortable understanding, right? So things like uh, relatively reasonable range of temperatures, uh, relatively reasonable humidity levels, okay? No crazy radiation, uh, standard chemical composition and concentrations, okay? So things you think about like comfortable for you to live, habitable, but um, prokaryotes are weird. So some of them prefer conditions that are very similar to the conditions that we do well in, like, oh, let's say Staph aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes, right? These are bacteria that can invade and live in your body, sometimes cause disease. They like the same conditions that you like, about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, humid, not too salty, not too wet, right, sort of medium. But then you have what are called extremophiles. That means they like, so philic means attracted to or liking. You guys remember hydrophobic versus hydrophilic from chemistry back in the day from uh, bio one. So phobic means afraid of or repelled and philic means attracted to or likes. So if you are philic to extremes, that means you like extreme conditions. Extremes of things like pressure, temperature, salinity, uh, sugar content, radiation even, right? So you've got extremophiles or examples of prokaryotic groups that can live anywhere, basically, okay? Places that are not habitable for most other life forms, you can still find prokaryotes there. You can find these extremophiles. We'll talk about some examples of that going forward um, as well. So there's a link here to the Human Microbiome Project. This I don't really care that much about. You don't have to like explore this. There's nothing on the test about this. But I'd like to mention it here because we talked a little bit in uh, Think in Lab about the Human Genome Project, which is basically mapping the entire human genome and figuring out where all the nucleotides fall and where all the genes are and what they do, right? When that was completed, what are you going to do next? So the next big thing is the Human Microbiome Project. Have you guys heard of your microbiome before? This means the microorganisms that live in and on your body. Okay, um, anybody ever heard of or taken or been prescribed probiotics? You guys know what they are? What are probiotics? Yeah, they're bacteria that you just take a capsule. You've got little colony forming units that are in there and swallow it and then they can colonize your gut if they make it through, right? Why do we do that? That seems like a weird thing to do, eat bacteria. If you're saying it's not weird, right? Why isn't it weird? Yeah, so there's lots of good, helpful bacteria that live in your intestines already. So if you need to replenish them for some reason, you can do so by taking probiotics, okay? If you've been on a recent round of antibiotics and killed off a lot of good things living in there, maybe take some probiotics. Um, digestive issues that some people have, irritable bowel and things like that can sometimes be helped with probiotics by sort of normalizing that flora that live in your intestines. But it's not just intestines, it's any mucous membrane and your skin your teeth, basically everywhere. Um, in fact, they used to say that, the, um, that there were so many microscopic life forms living in your body and on your body that you were actually more prokaryote than eukaryote if you counted cell to cell, okay? Counted the number of bacteria living in and on your body, there would be more, 10 to one used to be the going ratio but compared to your own human cells. That's a lot, right? You're like a walking microbiome. Now the newest research says that it's at the least it's one to one. So you're at least half prokaryotes, okay? 
So there are as many prokaryotic cells living in an on you as there are human cells. So it's an interesting thing to think about. So that's what the Human Microbiome Project is, is looking at everybody's microbial profile. Who lives there? Where do they live? How do they compare to one another? Um, is it genetic? Is it environmental? Sometimes it depends on who you live with. So your microbiome may be more similar to the people that you live with, whether you're related to them or not. Is it eating the same thing? Is it doing surfaces and things like that? We're talking about these microbiomes. We're also talking about symbionts, okay? The other species beside you that are living with you in cooperation, okay? So we're talking about mutualism, meaning you both benefit from the relationship or commensalism, which means you're not harmed, but the bacteria are helped. Right, so one partner benefits, the other one is like, no, that's the most beautiful. So when you get into uh, pathogenicity, that's a different story, right? That's when you've got bacteria living in your body that are causing you problems. Okay, but most of these dudes, for the most part, are helpful or at the very least harmless. Okay, so that's microbiome. So they are literally everywhere, prokaryotes, including a large part of your walking around dry Okay. All right. So you could probably guess who was here first. When we start talking about the earliest life forms on the planet, prokaryotes are before eukaryotes, right? That makes sense. They're simpler. They don't have a nucleus, right? Parsimony, the simplest explanation would be that simple comes before complex. And that's true, that's the case. So we have evidence um, for the appearance of the first prokaryotes about three and a half billion years ago, just to remind you how old the Earth is, only about a billion years older than that. Okay, so the Earth was still forming and it was still like molten lava and gases that you can't breathe and all sorts of things going on in the Hadean and beyond. And then about a billion years into it, things start chilling out a little bit and becoming habitable for at least these first extremophiles. And the first evidence of prokaryotes um, in the fossil record are about three and a half billion years ago. Okay, we'll look at what those fossils were, were, would look like. It's kind of hard to imagine what the fossil of a bacterial cell looks like. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But before we do that, let's just remember that the early atmosphere was much different than today. The main difference that matters in our discussion is that there is no O2, no molecular oxygen. So these early prokaryotes were not aerobic. Okay, they are anaerobes. They were able, capable of living with no oxygen. Uh, extreme conditions, violent geological activity still ongoing as the planet is cooling and forming and continents are doing their things and uh, tons of radiation as well, bombarding the surface of the planet from the sun because the ozone layer doesn't exist yet. What is ozone? Do you guys know? O3. So there's no oxygen. There's no O3, there's no ozone layer, there's no insulation from the UV rays of the sun. So radiation is hot. It's basically hell. It's like a hell state, right? Early, um, early Earth. So these earliest prokaryotes would have been well adapted to those extreme conditions. There are some um, pieces of evidence that let us know that life was flourishing in what you would call safer areas, deep in the ocean, hydrothermal vents, um, under the crust of the Earth. Why would it be beneficial or safer to live under the crust? Probably that radiation, right? It gives you some protection if you're living underground. All right, so what did this early evidence look like? Uh, we're talking about microbial mass and stromatolites. Okay, so we'll get to that. This is a picture of some stromatolites. They look kind of like rocks. They're basically um, fossils of microbial mass. So let's look at what that means. Um, when you're talking about microbial mass, these guys don't have to be just bacteria, they are mixed, okay? Bacteria and archaea, so microbes. So these are term microbes, it can be a blanket term to mean both groups. So they're sheets of prokaryotes. The thing about prokaryotes is they don't live alone. So you're almost never going to find one bacteria all by itself, right? They generally live uh, in some sort of colonial circumstances. Uh, cooperative at least. Oftentimes they stick together. We'll talk about that going forward. Um, so you've got these basically like films, okay, these sheets of prokaryotes, um, and they tend to keep colonizing the same area over and over because it worked well the first time. 
So you've got layers upon layers. They tend to grow at the interface of different types of materials. A good example of that is the sea floor. And so we, when you're saying interface, you're talking about the interaction between the sand at the bottom or the rocks and the water. Right? So you've got that sort of uh, interaction of those two different types of substrate. And that's often where you find microbial mass forming. Over time, those microbial mass, when prokaryotes die in one sheet, they just stay there. Okay, the next sheet grows over top of it, and the next sheet on top of that, and so on and so forth. So over time, what happens, the way that you form stromatolites is basically that the um, sediment, so silt or sand or whatever is washing into these microbial mass gets trapped in there, and it sort of hardens up over time. So you end up with these layered rocks. You can kind of see the layers look kind of wavy here in this picture, um, which indicate uh, layer upon layer of these microbial mass that basically fossilize. So that's what a stromatolite is um, fossil microbial mass. Does that kind of make sense? So, this is what we see because you're not going to find a single bacterial cell in a rock and chip away at it and be like, Eureka, it's a fossil of a micro. It can really work like that. So, you're looking at these uh, stromatolites. So, that's our earliest evidence, um, and we can date them and see how old they are, and that's where we get that 3.5 billion years. Okay? So really, really old lands. All right, a little bit more about the ancient atmosphere. Remember, no oxygen. Uh, the term for that is anoxic, right? Without oxygen. Um, so the earliest organisms, again, were anaerobic. That's the term that we were just using a second ago. Um, about 2.7 billion years ago, we see the appearance of a really important group called the cyanobacteria. Um, you may have heard them referred to before as blue-green algae. You guys heard of blue-green algae or cyanobacteria? Okay, so the term blue-green algae is slowly falling out of favor because it's, un, it's incorrect. So the algae are um, eukaryotes. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. These guys are bacteria. They are prokaryotes, so they're not really algae. Okay, so cyanobacteria is the correct terminology for these things. The reason they're so important is that they are photosynthetic. What does that mean that these cyanobacteria can do? If you are photosynthetic, what are you doing? Making your own food. Yep, they're making their own food. How? Energy from the sun. And carbon from the air and the water. Yeah, the atmosphere. Yep. So the evolution of photosynthesis changes everything. It changes the atmosphere because if you need CO2, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere to make the sugar, right, that you're doing, that you're producing as a photosynthetic organism, what is your gas byproduct? What are you releasing? Oxygen, right? So photosynthesis, carbon dioxide in, oxygen out. So cyanobacteria are pretty much solely responsible for the production of oxygen in the atmosphere 2.7 billion years ago and going forward. Okay, so without this evolution of this chemical pathway that leads to the production of oxygen as a byproduct of the metabolism of these cyanobacteria, there's no aerobic life. Okay, so thank you to these dudes, right? Cyanobacteria, first photosynthetic organism. Um, oxygenates the atmosphere, ultimately allowing for the evolution of all aerobic life forms. And look at this, contribute to the formation of the ozone layer. So it gives us oxygen and uh, protection from radiation from the sun all at the same time over billions of years but you get my drift right so really really important uh, in the evolution of life as we know it is the appearance of cyanobacteria but it takes almost a billion years from the first appearance of prokaryotes until we see cyanobacteria it's a really slow progression okay before that happens questions you guys good? Does that all make sense? So think of cyanobacteria the next time you see them. I keep pointing at the wrong thing because I forget my remote over there. I guess I fixed it. It's working. Who knows? All right, here's a little bit more about extremophiles. These guys right here are definitions that I will expect for you to know. Okay, so on the exam, you'll see these terms, and I want you to be able to tell me what conditions does that type of bacteria or archaea like. What type of condition does it adapt to? What do these names, what do these names mean? Um, however, you do not need to memorize 
numbers. All right, I'm not going to ask you for ranges of temperatures between thermophiles and hyperthermophiles, for example. Okay, I don't need you to spend your valuable time memorizing nonsense. Okay, thanks to kids. If you become a uh, microbiologist studying hyperthermophiles, you will probably know that range. Okay, on the back of your hand, do you need to know it now? No, at all. Absolutely not. So don't, don't ever memorize stuff like this unless I specifically tell you that you need to, okay, which will not usually be the case. So what I want to do quickly is talk about the conditions. Okay, so that's what you do need to know. Um, acidophiles, what do you think they like? Yeah, low pH. So pH three or below. I'm not going to ask you three, but just note acidic conditions or low pH. What about alkalophiles? Basic. Yeah, alkaline conditions. Thermophiles and hyperthermophiles. What does thermo mean? It does, but it usually refers to heat. Okay, so thermophiles are, are warm, they like warm temperatures. So 60 to 80 C, which is pretty hot in Fahrenheit, 140 to 176 Fahrenheit. Then you've got hyperthermophiles up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot, right? Um, so that's what you've got with your ambassador kind of thermophiles and hyperthermophiles. Then you've got psychrophiles, and psycho maybe not a term you've heard before, but that means cold. Okay, so that's lower than 5 to 50 Fahrenheit. That's 50 doesn't seem that cold, but you know, uncomfortable, I guess. Halo files, you guys know what halo means? You've seen that before? Salt. Okay, so halophilic um, extremophiles like high salt concentration. When you think about things like salt or even sugar, so osmophiles, that's sugar. Okay, so halo, salt, osmo, sugar. Do you guys remember the term osmoregulation or osmolarity? Did you learn about that in bio one? What about tonicity? Remember tonicity? Osmosis? Some of you are nodding slowly. We're talking about water moving across the semipermeable membrane, right? And we're talking about osmosis. So if you are a, like let's say you take an animal cell and you put it into an incredibly salty glass of water, what happens to that cell? Some of you are saying things like lysis. Lysis, that would probably be in a uh, watery solution, but it's taken on water, right? In, this, in terms of salt, the water's going to go out of the cell, right? Because water's going to follow uh, concentration of solutes. So water inside the cell is going to leak out into the salt, and the cell's going to show up. Cremation, the opposite of lysis. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. So you're definitely on the right track. And I'm not, again, going to ask you to relearn tonicity and tell me any like problems about that right now. Okay, um, but what I want you to think about is why this is extreme. Okay, you can't really, most cells can't just live in salt because you would show up and die. Same with sugar. Water follows, follows solute, so it's going to exit out of the cell. And okay? we're going to talk about how uh, bacterial cells and archaeal cells have a cell wall to protect them against those types of changes. Okay, but some of them are really well protected and they can live in those super high concentration of um, salt and sugar. Okay. So what you guys need to know here is type and condition, but you don't have to memorize the numbers, just know the condition, okay? That's fair? Yeah, you can do it. Those are the easy questions. Those are just definitions. Um, oh, I always like to talk about Dianococcus a little bit. This guy's species name is Radiodurans. Any guesses based on this species name, what type of conditions this guy is well adapted to living in? Yeah. Radiation, it can withstand radiation. So if you've ever worked in a, in a lab or been inside of a microbiology lab and seen, uh, you know those hoods where you do the work under the glass, you know, like you get to protect yourself? There's a button on those hoods where you push a button and UV light turns on. You know what that does? It kills most bacteria that live on surfaces, but not these guys, but they can withstand radiation. So just another cool example of, a, of an extreme of All right. I'm like bragging about my remote. On the biofilms, we've touched on this a little bit already. These are the sheets that I'm talking about. So most prokaryotes live in interactive communities. We call them biofilms. Sounds kind of gross. A biofilm is a microbial community held together by a gummy, sticky matrix. That just means they secrete sugar that helps them stick to each other. Okay? So mostly polysaccharides, which are just sugar molecules, right? Um, they grow on all types of surfaces, super common in your household drains or on the cutting boards, 
Uh, sometimes medical implant devices, you'll see biofilms grow on those. And everybody's favorite biofilm is dental plaque. Yes, friends, that's why you brush your teeth a couple of times a day and floss regularly because there are bacterial communities forming biofilms on your teeth. Hmm, exciting, right? Um, the reason that they do this is because it allows them to be stronger. It's like strength in numbers, right? So it is harder to uh, sanitize the surface with a whole bunch of bacteria or archaea on it working together, stuck together with sugar than it is to get rid of a free living purple. Okay, so sanitization techniques um, have to be stronger to get rid of biofilms. Um, sometimes it's physical scrubbing that you have to do to get rid of it. So it's kind of like the toothbrush. All right, so that's the biofilm. It's basically that cooperation that allows for um, robustness of the population or strength. All right, so just know what a biofilm is and brush your teeth. Let's talk about structures. Again, same uh, pattern that we saw in the virus chapter, right? We talked a little bit about the organism, where you find them, how they act. Now we'll learn some terminology for some uh, morphology, okay? All right, so all cells, prokaryote and eukaryote, have four structures in common. Do you think I'm going to ask you to know what those four structures are that all cells have in common? That sounds like something I would do, right? Okay, here they are, plasma membrane. Every cell has a plasma membrane separates the interior from the exterior. You gotta have a boundary or you don't have a cell. So that one's kind of a gimme. Every cell has a plasma membrane. What else does a plasma membrane do for a cell? It's that separation, but it's also uh, selective, right? Transport, letting stuff in, letting stuff out. So you gotta have a plasma membrane. Um, all cells have cytoplasm. That's again, kind of a gimme. Um, that's the jelly-like stuff inside of the cell, inside the plasma membrane, where you find your cellular components, okay? If you are looking at a eukaryotic cell and you have a whole bunch of organelles in there, those are counted in the cytoplasm, okay? So it's everything, basically, if you're talking about a eukaryotic cell, it's everything outside of the nucleus and inside of the plasma membrane, it's all the stuff. The reason it's jelly-like is because it has all that stuff in it, okay? So the fluid portion is cytosol, and this should be review, if you remember, from Bio 1, but not like, you know, I expect you to spit it out easily, but it was there, it's in there somewhere. Cytosol is the fluid component, organelles or cell components. If you're talking about a bacterial cell, it doesn't have those organelles, but there are other things in there, like ribosomes and dissolved solutes and um, other kinds of weird stuff. So we've got stuff. Basically, the cytoplasm is the stuff inside. So plasma membrane outside holding the cytoplasm in the inside, one and two. Three is DNA, okay? If you're a living organism, you've got it, right? So every cell has DNA. The difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is how it's stored, nucleus or no nucleus. And then finally, you've got ribosomes. Every cell has to have ribosomes. What are ribosomes responsible for? Protein synthesis. Every cell has DNA, which means every cell has to transcribe that DNA into messenger RNA. And then that messenger RNA has to be translated into protein in order for that cell to make anything, right? And that all happens on the ribosome. Do you think, based on what you know about prokaryotic cells, that ribosomes are membrane-bound organelles? They're not, right? Because remember, prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles. Ribosomes aren't membrane-bound. They're made up of their own particular type of RNA called ribosomal RNA for rRNA. So all cells have those, okay? The ribosomes get people every time because they're thinking it's an organelle and, and prokaryotes don't have organelles, but it's not membrane bound, so they're there. The plasma membrane, cytoplasm, DNA, ribosome, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, it doesn't matter. That cell has got those things, okay? So make sure that you're comfortable with that. And then the stuff about prokaryotes here, this is reviewed from earlier slides. We know we're talking about bacteria and archaea. We know they're unicellular. They lack a nucleus. Here's that term that Cheyenne brought up earlier, nucleolar. Okay, that's where the DNA is located inside the prokaryotic cell. So the DNA, even inside of the bacterium, isn't just floating around all crazy. Okay, remember, those are, those are fragile molecules. Okay, so it can't just be sort of like 
tossing around inside the cell. That wouldn't be very uh, smart. So they are, they do sort of house their DNA collected into a little wad, if you will, called the nucleoid. So that's what's pictured here in the red in this image, just coiled up DNA, nucleoid region. Often if you see oid, it means resemble. Okay, have you guys ever, any sci-fi fans ever heard of like humanoids? What's a humanoid? No? A robot? Human-like features. Huh? Typically they have human-like features. Human-like features, yeah. It looks like a human, but it's not. Right? Oid means resemble. You may come across that uh, subject later in your life too, so it's good to know. The nucleoid means it resembles the nucleus, because that's where the DNA is, all coiled up, but it's not a nucleus. There's no envelope, okay? Uh, again, you know this, lac membrane bound organelles. Um, these are some new terms that we're introducing. You may see a flagella. You guys have heard that term before probably. What's a flagella? Or a flagellum? Flagella is the plural. Like a tail? Yeah, it's kind of like a tail, and it whips like this. What's it for? Moving from one place to another. So you may see a little whip-like tail. It's an extension of the um, cell membrane and cytoplasm. And it's for motility, moving around. Maybe you have one, maybe you have two. Some, some, some things are multi-flagellate and they have a bunch and they move in different directions, but that's what they're for. Um, you also might see pili or pili, this, the singular is pilus. We saw that in our, in our question, our, um, excuse me, our one sort of pre-test question on the um, who, who. But each one of these little white sort of uh, hair-like looking extensions on this picture is a pilus. And pili are used for reproduction or conjugation. Okay, we're going to look at what conjugation is. Um, bacteria and archaea, as single celled prokaryotes, do not use sexual reproduction. Right? How do they reproduce? Do you know? Do they undergo cell division? Yes, they have to, right? But it's not mitosis. Mitosis, remember, is eukaryotic cell division because you have to do all that uh, division and replication of chromosomes in the nucleus and then the nucleus splits and that's the whole thing that you learn in mitosis. Bacteria don't do that. Prokaryotes don't do that. They don't have a nucleus. All they have to do is replicate their single chromosome that they have and then split in two. It's binary fission. Okay, so it's not sexual reproduction. We're talking about reproduction with pili, we're really talking about conjugation. So I should probably just take this out altogether to eliminate confusion. But what conjugation is, and we'll get to this in a later slide too, so don't worry if you're not catching it all right now. The definition is coming at you later. This is when two bacterial cells connect to each other through a pilus and exchange pieces of DNA. So even though you don't have that genetic recombination that you see in sexual reproduction, you still have that shared uh, sharing of pieces of DNA. So you can get genetic transfer or horizontal gene transfer. You guys remember we talked about that a little bit in chapter 20 um, through conjugation in prokaryotes. Okay, and that's what pylon is for. All right. Those are just those external um, structures that they can connect up. Bacteria, uh, most like bacteria are going to have a cell wall made out of a, a compound called peptidoglycan. We'll talk about this more later as well, just a little bit. Um, that cell wall serves the purpose of protection against changes in osmosis or osmotic changes, changes in osmotic pressure, I should say. So just like plant cells, that cell wall is there to provide structural integrity. Okay? Remember, we just talked about what happens if you plop an animal cell into a glass of salt water, it's going to lose water until it shrinks. If you plop an animal cell into a glass of pure water with no solutes, it's going to take on water until it lyses or bursts. So because bacteria, single cell uh, prokaryotes, they don't have any way to sort of regulate that water uh, intake or, or output, that cell wall helps them resist those changes. Okay, so you're going to see that peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, and you may also see a capsule, which is, mm, you could compare it to an envelope in a virus. It's the capsule, it's a coating made out of polysaccharides. Again, it's sugar. Um, it's part of what helps them form those biofilms. It's part of what helps them attach to uh, other cells that they're getting into when they're, say, for example, getting into uh, make you sick. So you may see a capsule. That's just an outer uh, coating. Okay. But these are just some, some commonly sort of referenced prokaryotic morphological structures. Okay, so just know what they are. Flagella, 
pilot, uh, cell wall, and capsule. Okay, just looking at the morphology. And then this is just a generalized, again, as the caption says here, structure. So every prokaryote does not look like this. Okay, there's a lot of um, diversity in form, but this is just a nice little drawing to sort of illustrate those pieces that we were just talking about. Okay, so morphology. That will be helpful uh, going forward when we start talking about other stuff, including um, that cell wall again, which we probably will get to on Wednesday. Yeah, we got a four minutes. I'm going to do shape and then we'll stop. Okay, and we'll talk about field drift for those of you going today. Um, this is just one of many ways to classify bacteria or archaea, but we're mostly talking about bacteria here. We aren't terribly interested in human health about uh, archaea. Do you guys know why? Can you guess? If, if human medicine doesn't mess with them too much, what do you think they do not do? They don't make sense. Yeah, there's no archaea that we've identified that cause diseases in anything. Not in humans, not in other animals, not in other organisms at large. So when we're talking about medicine, we're usually talking about bacteria. Okay, that'll come up again later. I'll remind you that we said that. But this is just one way to classify um, prokaryotes um, by shape. So cocci means it's spherical. They look like little balls, okay? So like streptococcus. This is the one I mentioned earlier, pyogenes. It causes strep throat in, in people. That is a coccus bacteria, it's spherical. What I'm gonna expect you guys to be able to do is recognize it by the picture, okay? So I'll give you a photo uh, of a micrograph of a bacterial cell and ask you, is it, is it spherical, cocci? Is it rod-shaped or bacilli? Okay, bacilli is the term for rod-shaped bacteria, or is it spirilla? You guessed it, spiral. So that should be pretty straightforward. Um, and there are a couple of examples here of, of each shape, okay? Just to give you a uh, reference, okay? I'm not gonna ask you what bacteria causes anthony. And okay, that's not what this slide is about, this is about the shape. So this is just there to give you an example of that particular type of bacteria. And in these cases, their genus name actually reflects the shape of the cell. Okay, so that's just one way to classify bacteria. So just know the names and know what they look like to be able to map those up. And I think that's a good place. Yeah, perfect. We'll stop here because the next direction we're heading in is the evolution of these groups. So it's a totally different topic. So it's a good place to stop. Okay.